When I hear the talk, I, I hear uh, protecting. I'm raising two boys in predominantly white area. So the talk is a lot different. You know, for us being white people, we never had that talk. The talk to us was the birds and the bees. I think the talk stems from people trying to stay alive. My mom told me from day one that you have to make sure that you are outshining anybody that's in the room. We're seeing things through the eyes of a black seven-year-old and not, you know, 43-year-old white folks. many people of color, the talk is just like a rite of passage. It's the heartfelt conversation that parents of black and brown children have been having for years to prepare them for a world that may not view them equally. But as we're more divided as a society, more people have become curious about the talk, what it means, why it's necessary, and how do we come together to make sure in the future it's no longer needed. The talk is all about helping a young person, young black person, young person of color, stay out of trouble. I remember the talk that I got living in West Philly. You know, if you watch who you hang around, you know, uh, the cops approach you, make sure you, yes, you know, make sure, yes, sir, do what you need to do. Let me fight the fight. West Philly. It's like, boy, I don't want you to get in trouble. I want you to come home tonight. I love you and need you to be here when I get here and not be harmed, hurt abused, accused, any of those things. The America that we experience is differently. And being, you know, being ignored, being ridiculed, being uh, told that, you know, you're using a race card, or you're being dramatic, or that that doesn't play out. Um, we're saying like, no, it's a systemic issue. It's a challenge. You're, you're trying to, to prepare her for things that she may or may not see your experience when you haven't seen or experienced them for yourself. Um, so, so sometimes it's hard to try and see the world through her eyes, but that's the best thing you can try to do. All the people we spoke to represent different backgrounds because contrary to what many believe, the talk is being had regardless of where you live, your family income, education level, or political affiliation. Families having the talk will tell you it's not really about who or what you are, it's largely about others' perception of you. It's not there's something wrong with us, there's something wrong with society. And in order to keep someone safe in a complicated, problematic society, here are some strategies for how to deal with it. Andre is a filmmaker and educator who travels teaching about overcoming racism and division. Chris and Adrian adopted Mila from Sierra Leone as a baby. She's a talented, funny, amazing little girl. But they also have become immediately aware how all of those things are only part of what society may see and how it weighs on parents. A lot of our friends may not see us as the parents of a black child. So you see, you hear stories about Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Antoine Rose and, and, and all of them and I don't think they could see how those stories might scare us. It might be our biggest nightmare when we're up at night getting ready to go to bed, that that could be Mila. Sharif el Meki is a nationally recognized educator, but also a parent. His talk, both received from his family and given to his children, was more from an activist perspective. You don't prove your humanity, though. Like, there's no reason to try to prove your humanity, and I think that's what um, essentially, I try to teach my children, uh, don't, don't go about trying to prove your humanity. You can defend it, you know, but you don't need to prove it to anyone. And Joel, Kevin, and Jared, fathers and professionals who on this day represented Daddy University, a group preparing and advocating for fathers who, among other things, will or have faced the struggle of the talk. You have to find that balance on when to break their innocence, right? It's because they're children at the end of the day. So you don't want to like give them too much, but at the same time, you just want them to be prepared. And um, kind of finding that balance is, is really important. I don't look forward to it, um, but it is something that I understand is necessary in order for him to survive here. I don't want to raise them to be hate, hate or bitter, and I want them to be able to love uh, while teaching them to be careful. It's, it's complicated. Yes, it is complicated. And everyone that we spoke to agrees that there's a fine line between wanting to prepare their children for the world and wanting to allow them the opportunity to maintain their innocence. 
And frankly, hearing some of the stories may sound ridiculous to those who thankfully have never had to deal with them. Be mindful, don't be the first one that gets up and dances. You know, if you're, if you're at a function, you know, eh, why don't you go with the baked chicken and not the fried chicken? Just the subtle things, it's like, yo, it's summertime, I love, I know, we love watermelon at home, but when we out, you're gonna rock with some of that, 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 that grapefruit or something like that. Kevin is raising his kids out in the suburbs, and it's not unusual for them to be one of a handful of children of color. And he says yes. He's even aware of stereotypes about things as seemingly unimportant as food. Hi, Mr. Bill. And as much attention as Adrian and Chris pay to educating Mila about her background and culture and wanting her to just be a seven-year-old. I hope that people see my daughter for who she is, which is a kind, caring, empathetic, intelligent little seven-year-old who is just like every other American kid and who just has a dual visa. The reminders of what she and other kids of color are perhaps unconsciously internalizing, it's heartbreaking. A police officer drove down the street and was going around the block and Mila immediately, she immediately threw her hands up and I thought to myself, wow, I don't know what we said in the process of George Floyd, but she immediately took it as I just need to, to show my hands and show that I'm not a threat and put my hands up. These are examples of why the talk is important, but also of how difficult it is for parents to navigate. Why is that protest happening? You know, why are they showing that picture of that man, you know, being choked to death? Why, you know what I mean? Like they see and hear that, so we have to have the conversation, right? Like it's just, it's hard for that to just be ignored. Um, even if they're, you know, young children. But because these talks are mostly happening in an attempt to shape and prepare young children of color in mostly homes of people of color, everyone we spoke to also acknowledges that the more opportunities we have to share these issues outside of just those homes, that represents a real opportunity for growth. You know, I, I have a talk I've been giving lately, and it's we have diversity, we have inclusion, we have equity, we need change. And the change that has to happen has to happen in here and up here. So we've begun to explain the idea of the talk, but has it changed from generation to generation? And how do we as adults prepare young people for the current world while never losing track of trying to make it better? has largely changed as society has changed. And that's not to say that we're not making progress, we are. And because of that, parents have had to adjust the talk that they may have received to better reflect society today. The talk that I received was, you know, be direct, be nice, but you're a human being, you know, and uh, not only protecting your, uh, yourself and your body, but also protect your dignity. I remember my first time feeling bitter. Um, we were playing in a park. These other kids came up, we played football, catch in the park. The other kids were European, Caucasian. And we played it, and we eventually ended up winning. And afterwards, there was this slew of these new words that I had not recognized before. We're seeing things through the eyes of a, seven, a black seven-year-old and not you know, 43 year old white folks. I think that most would agree that it's a good thing that how we talk to children of color is changing, but parents remind us that a different talk doesn't necessarily mean it's any less significant. I remember my son walking down the street and as he's coming towards me, I'm like, what is he wearing? So he just has a baseball hat on, some sunglasses and one of my bandanas over his face prior to COVID. So I'm looking like I was angry with, and scared at the same time because I realized if somebody sees you, you can get shot. You can get arrested. Not because of what you did, it's because of how you look. Kids in the neighborhood are all playing with the little Nerf guns and everything else. No, Mila, you can't play with the Nerf gun. because I. It, although she may be a seven-year-old with a Nerf gun now, if she's eight or nine with a Nerf gun, she may not get the same level of understanding that some of the other children in the neighborhood may if it's uh, law enforcement or even a parent sometimes. Maybe the hardest part about the talk is that the need for it is clear to the parents and communities giving it for years. But like with many things in society, getting others to understand why it's necessary and that their reality isn't everyone's reality, 
That's the real challenge. It's to be those uh, shows, uh, the Twilight Zone, <laughs> where you can see two people and they have literally same room, same everything, and they can have literally two different uh, realities. One of the greatest white privileges is knowing what other white people say in a room full of white people, because it's very unfiltered and it lets you know what they say in other circles. Now, hearing that as the parent of a black child is concerning. When you talk about privilege, it's like trying to tell a fish that it's swimming in water. A fish is like, what do you mean? I'm just swimming. I'm just living. I'm not doing anything. I'm not in water. I'm in the world. It's like, yeah, the water's all around you. You can't see it. It's your, it's your everyday existence. And one way to get people to recognize their existence and perhaps the privilege that comes with it is an exercise in one of Andre's films. So the privilege walk is one of them. And the privilege walk is, you know, everybody gets on the line and you ask people to step forward based on benefits they may have. For instance, one of them is if you go into a grocery store and no one ever stops to ask you if you work there, take one step forward. You know, if, you're under, if people ask you, can, can, they, can they touch your hair, take one step back. And the whole idea is making people understand what it means to never have these issues. And the people who end up in the front of the room are the folks who are privileged, they don't have these problems in society. And the folks on the back are the ones who aren't privileged. The Privilege Walk has been an eye-opening visualization of the importance of the talk to those who have experienced it, but it isn't without its issues. It's a painful exercise for everyone involved, because folks are in the front like, oh, snap, I didn't ask for these privileges. You know, that's not fair. And then folks in the back are saying, why am I being denied? I, I didn't design this system. I had nothing to do with it, but I am in the back of the line. And identifying that privilege can sometimes cause more harm than good. When you say someone's privilege, people get defensive. People get more concerned about being called racist than they do about racism. But all the parents we spoke to pointed out that as difficult as the conversations are, they're among the only ways to get to a point in society where we approach a time when the talk is a memory more than a current concern. I don't think they really grasp what the talk is, but even then, I don't want them to grasp the talk. I want you to grasp, really, why there is a need for a talk. I think it's not just, at this point in time, um, a black family's talk that should be had. I feel that everybody should have this talk. I'm a man. Uh, this, this child of mine is a human being, you know, this uh, student of mine is a human being. Um, it's frustrating to have to say it, but it's also, you know, uh, it's imperative. Like, we can't stop. You know, which of my ancestors am I going to look at and say, I got too tired to fight? <laughs> you know, which one? Like, would I have the audacity to, to turn to and say, like, hey, you know what, I just, I just gave up. I, I didn't, um, you know, I got too frustrated. Becoming aware of the talk is a first step, but what can we do to continue to make things better? I would imagine that difficult conversations are just part of being a parent, not just the parent of a child of color. But interestingly enough, even as everyone acknowledged the challenges, they also say that they remain undeterred and encouraged about the future. I just believe, I believe in all of us. You know, I really do. I really do believe that we can change and be better. I just wish that you know, as powerful as America is, I wish it could be just as kind and just as accepting and inclusive. And, you know, you lose faith sometimes, but you know that you got this precious little girl who you're fighting for. I also refuse, refuse as a father to not teach hope. I refuse. I don't want to look at these results and, and say that there's no more right. hope. I don't want to look at that. I tell my kids all the time, I know that this world is a good, good world because it's still here. The talk is still definitely about preparation. My mom told me from day one that you have to make sure that you are outshining anybody that's in the room, essentially, just to survive. Just to survive. But what wasn't following that message was you got to work twice as hard and you're enough. The twice as hard is not about you being less. The twice, the twice as hard is about the fact that there are rules, legislation, laws, programs, policies in place to keep you down. And you're working twice as hard to get past them. The talk isn't about being less than or victimized, 
quite the contrary. It's about being prepared to continue towards change. It's a heavy topic, so you're always wondering, is it too much for the mind of a seven and a half year, seven and a half year old? But then you're also looking at it like, you have to tell her. If I was a father of white children, I would tell them, if you got a good friend in Kevin's kids, defend him, because you're going to be tested. And for my sons as well, if you have a friend and his, and his, his children, defend them and say, these are my crew, and, 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 and we're going to walk with each other. Because with everything we've explained so far, the message is now and has always been hope. You know, people who are saying, like, oh, whether they're an ally or not, that they, uh, a better job needs to be done for listening, for being empathetic, and, and trying to understand uh, what is it like for other people. How do they experience this city, this town, this country? There is hope. There is a possibility for change. Um, there are better people than there are not. Um, and I, have, I cannot teach a lack of hope. So do you better understand the talk now? Up next, we'll give all of our guests the chance to offer their thoughts and goals on the next steps of the talk. Listen, telling people about a reality that they may not have experienced can be difficult, challenging, even lead to resentment. And so we wanted to allow everyone the opportunity to share their takeaways and the reasons why they feel, even with all the challenges, that the talk is moving in the right direction. Civil rights happened because we came together and there were Jews and Catholics and, and, and Muslims all together for these things. And so I know that they are not all the same and they don't all look alike and they know that we don't all look alike. That's the question you need to ask yourself. Why do they have to have the talk? Why is it that my child, who is white, who's great friends with this black kid, and I know their family and they're great, why is there a need for a talk that I don't have to give my white child? Now, as you've heard, the talk has been about preparing and protecting children of color, but they also shared with us that it's not just parents that have a role in changing the perceptions that divide us. It's important because if your uh, white counterparts like see black people um, being successful and in their arenas and, and in their neighborhoods and things like that, then they'll be more comfortable with race. Um, but if they don't, then, you know, then they kind of have these preconceived notions that they already see. Seeing a 6'5 young man on Villanova's campus having conversations with faculty, like, doesn't mean he's on basketball team. He could be a 6'5 accounting major, accounting major. Just don't put him in that box. The whole purpose of our film, the privileged wealth conversation, is moving away from the concept of individual meanness as a form of racism and moving to a discussion of racism as structural and systemic. Is bigger than us. And if we realize that many of the reasons for the talk are bigger than us as individuals, then perhaps we'll be more comfortable working together. For white people, the most important thing is to try to listen and hear, not listen and attempt to respond. But with that goal in mind, the talk reminds each of us that we each have a role to play in creating the world we want to live in. You have a movie called The Prep School Negro, a movie called I'm the Racist Am I? You have these heavy titles. I know you're not making a lot of money. Why do you do it? And I said, you know, I do it for very selfish reasons. I do it so I can sleep better at night. Because I look at what's happening in the world and how things exist and, and the problems we have, and I'm trying to change all of them by doing a little something. So over the last 30 minutes, we have a better understanding of how challenging the talk can be to have, but also how vitally important it is for all of us to listen. And because of that, on behalf of Bill Rohr behind the camera, I'm Bill Anderson, thanking you for taking the time to share this experience with us and looking forward to the talk continuing in the future. <laughs>